Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Thursday, October 22nd. I'm Wayne Pratt. Professional dance is a tricky thing to pull off during a pandemic, yet the St. Louis Ballet is presenting an online performance this weekend with virus safety in mind. With everything about the pandemic, every touch, you're, you're just more aware of like just how close you are to this person as you're dancing, you know? Every interaction has been heightened. In a few minutes, St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin will tell us how members of the St. Louis Ballet rehearsed and performed together while trying to stay safe. Missouri Governor Mike Parson is calling lawmakers back to Jefferson City for another special legislative session. It will begin November 5th. The priority will be ensuring the state has access to additional federal funding for coronavirus response and recovery. Parson says the session will deal with the supplemental budget, which contains funding for items including school nutrition services, job training grants, and child support payments. We look forward to working with the General Assembly to make sure these funds are distributed across Missouri as soon as possible. Parson says he is open to discussing other topics during that special session if the legislature is on board. Questions remain about a timeline and access to an eventual coronavirus vaccine. That's after Missouri State Health Director Randall Williams recently rolled out plans to administer the shots. St. Louis Public Radio's Jacqueline Driscoll reports. The coronavirus plan places an emphasis on allowing every Missourian to get a vaccine for free. But the fine print says providers are able to charge an administration fee. The document suggests keeping that fee small. Williams says it'll be somewhere in the ballpark of $20. There'll be both a provider component to this, but there'll also be kind of mass vaccination. So um, I do not anticipate cost being a barrier to getting vaccinated. William says nursing home patients, their staff, and other health care workers are top priority. But it's still undetermined when the state will move into the next phase and begin vaccinating the next priority group. That includes first responders, teachers, and others. In Jefferson City, I'm Jacqueline Driscoll, St. Louis Public Radio. In Illinois, officials have met a Centers for Disease Control deadline to submit a plan for vaccine distribution. The state wants to prioritize health care workers, first responders, and those working with vulnerable populations. Department of Public Health Director Ngaze Azike acknowledges education around the eventual vaccine will be needed to get buy-in from the broader population. Getting the vaccine is one step, getting it into the arms of people is another. And so we need both of those for us to get to uh, a better state with this pandemic. Azike says there is no firm timetable for having a vaccine. Clinical trials are still taking place. Governor J.P. Pritzker says Illinois will not distribute a vaccine until it's proven safe and effective. St. Louis voters will decide November 3rd whether to lift the requirement that most people who work for the city live within its boundaries. St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Lippman has more on the debate over Proposition 1. If Proposition 1 passes, city employees except elected officials and high-level appointees won't be able to live where they want. Governor Mike Parson recently signed legislation temporarily lifting the requirement for police officers, firefighters, and other public safety workers. The police union has no plans to campaign for Prop 1, although the firefighters are working to put something together. 23rd Ward Alderman Joe Vaccaro thinks the proposition is still likely to pass. He sponsored the legislation putting the issue on the ballot. You figured there's 6,000 city employees plus their families. If they get out and vote, we should be able to get to that number. Proposition 1 needs 60 percent approval to pass. It has the support of most aldermen and Mayor Lida Krusen. I'm Rachel Lippman, St. Louis Public Radio. Members of the St. Louis Ballet believe they have discovered how to work safely during the pandemic. They recently recorded a performance the public can watch online this weekend. Dancers gathered last week for one of their last rehearsals before filming, and they regarded it as the latest milestone in a long path back to the stage. St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin reports. 
On a recent afternoon at St. Louis Ballet's rehearsal studios in Chesterfield, dancers found quiet spots in the hallways to stretch out alone. They wore masks because of the coronavirus. It's not the bustling scene you would have encountered here before the pandemic. But dancer Roxy Shackelford says it's a welcome sign of life following months of dormancy. It was great. <laughs> After so long, you know, being able to come into an actual studio and rehearse, do what we do. For most of the rehearsal, only one or two dancers were allowed in the studio at a time. Others watched through a window from a hallway. The company had been rehearsing for Swan Lake back in March when public gatherings were abruptly suspended. St. Louis Ballet executive and artistic director Gen Horiyuchi watched how ballet companies elsewhere coped with the pandemic by offering content online. But they're showing the productions of performance from the past. But I'm so tired of watching their old performances or performing outside with the street shoes. So I wanted to do something new, something at the theater. So Horiyuchi composed a new piece to fit the times. Audiences still have to watch it on their computer screens. But the company can rehearse and perform it together in person, safely. It's mainly a series of solos with short ensemble sections. The tricky parts are the three duets, or pas de deux. There's no way for dancers to stay socially distanced while doing that. So Horiuchi cast two pairs of dancers who live together, and two dancers who are willing to form their own little pandemic bubble, Rebecca Cornett and Michael Burke. They had to sit down with Burke's fiancé to work out a shared plan for coronavirus safety. That was a really interesting dynamic. The three of us kind of sat down before any of the rehearsal process started just to kind of make sure everything was okay. It was kind of like the roommate agreements you have in college about what you're okay with, what you're not. They decided not to return to the gyms they used to go to. When Burke's family visited from out of town recently, he declined his father's offer of a hug. They think they're keeping safe. But Cornette says it's still awkward to transition from pandemic isolation to dancing with someone. With everything about the pandemic, you know, every touch, you're, you're just more aware of like just how close you are to this person as you're dancing. You know, every interaction has been heightened. The production is bare bones, but intense. Horiuchi says it emphasizes the fundamentals of dance, something he tried to get at with the title. This is who we are. This is what we do. We are individually a, a dancer and we train ourselves to perform. So hopefully viewers you know, can see individual dancers' you know, strength, their uniqueness. The process has been familiar and strange, according to Burke. It's also very different seeing everybody dancing with their masks because so much of the emotion that we are trying to portray comes from our face. And so being able to see people just from the eyes, trying to portray that, it's really interesting. And so that is always a reminder of, yep, still in a pandemic. The dancers kept their masks on throughout rehearsals and right until the moment before they stepped on stage for the filming. And then for a few minutes, they once again just did what they do. I'm Jeremy Goodwin, St. Louis Public Radio. David Casares edited that report. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. From the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.